singing is so bad that at some point people would stop and go, what the heck is that? So, I want to welcome everybody to the Full Hall Advisory. Uh, my name is Thomas Aubin, in case you don't know, I'm the superintendent director of what I consider to be the best vocational school, uh, technical school in, in the state of Massachusetts. So, uh, on behalf of the staff and the school committee, I want to welcome you. Uh, we appreciate your support. The numbers are absolutely great. Especially in light of the fact that I know many of you are looking at your clock right now and going, Patriots are going to be on sometime around 8.20. So I'm going to try and speed up this presentation as quickly as I can. Last year at this time, I believe it was the Bruins opening night. Yeah. So we need to, as we're putting the cabin together, together, start taking a look at some of the sporting teams and, and, and really plan accordingly. Uh, as far as the Bruins go, I don't know if you know, but uh, their opening night was last night. I didn't show up for it, and neither did they. They lost 7 nothing. so uh, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, tonight's theme is going to be uh, reinvention, and before we get started on this, just a couple of notes. Uh, Diamond Regional, quite frankly, does not have to do anything different than we've been doing for the past 10 years, the past 20 years, the past 30 years, and we will still be considered a success. Why? Well, quite frankly, if you take a look at the academics that we receive at, at Diamond Regional, and again, I, I mentioned this at our 50th anniversary, and for you that attended, I want to thank you very much. Diamond has been providing an outstanding academic education since its inception in 1968. Things are no different now. If you take a look at our MCAS scores, we are exceptionally proud of our performance. In looking at the overall accountability number that we have, our accountability number is 69, which means in terms of all the schools in the state, we are somewhere in the top 31 or 31st percentile. So I mean, that is a real credit to the staff, both academic. So of course, what happens immediately is the department head of mathematics comes into my office and says, you know, we gotta work on some of this other stuff here. I know we can do better. This is why we're gonna to continue to grow and be better because the staff that you have here at Diamond will not settle for us because we have an understanding. We have a four year obligation to provide students with the, uh, the best education they can because what it means in many cases is quite frankly, an improvement in the quality of their lives. We take that responsibility seriously, and I can tell you that the staff takes it seriously. So, uh, but we have a small time to really congratulate ourselves on what was a really outstanding performance. So, and, you know, again, when we say, you know, education is not just about MCAS, no one knows that better than us. So I'll throw this out at you. It is now October the 4th. Uh, we have been in school for approximately one month and we have 195 seniors out on cooperative education. I think that deserves it. <laughs> what you're going to hear at some of the advisory meetings today is that they've run out of students to send to the businesses. In many of our programs, the construction cluster, the manufacturing cluster, they just aren't students left. Many of the students who are left will be going as soon as they get their license. So the fact that out of 329 seniors, we have 195 seniors out in the first month of school, that is a credit to the instructional staff here and certainly to our co-op coordinator. So when I say that we don't have to do anything differently, we know that there are shortages of labor. So the question becomes, why do you want to go through all of the efforts of trying to reinvent, which is our theme for this evening? Well, there's a couple of reasons. I'm going to show you a video, be about a six-minute video, and I'll talk a little more about it. So as we take a look at what's happening in industry, in business, you know better than we that things are changing, and they're changing rapidly. They're changing rapidly because technology is changing rapidly. You know, when you see robots that are able to sweep the hallways, you know that job is gone. It's gone forever. Because again, the purpose of business is to make money. For anyone who feels that that is bad business, they obviously are not business owners. <clears throat> the reality is people are in business to make money. So anything that a robot can do, or a non-human can do, they're gonna find a way to do it. So part of what we're gonna talk about today are, is really two things. You've, you've got sort of a 
a confluence of two things that are happening that we need to be aware of. The first one, as I mentioned, is the increase in technology. And again, the predictions are somewhere around 2023, you're going to see autonomous vehicles driving around. And I talked about this the last time, and I'm going to mention it again. Why is that the case? Because people will not stop texting and driving. They just won't. And you know, the insurance companies are tired of paying for it because it doesn't make market if you have to pay out because people are texting and driving. Now, the first day we had a freshman uh, for orientation, I, I said to all of them, I said, I want to welcome you to Diamond Regional, and if you haven't been told this, you're all a bunch of addicts. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a welcome wagon kind of statement when you take a look at that, and I had some parents up in the uh, back who were a little bit taken aback by it. <clears throat> but when we take a look at our students, when you take a look at the kids, they can't get away from their electronic device. They just can't. If you ask our teaching staff, what I should have taken was a video of 228 when school ends. Because in our hallways, you see nothing but the phones coming out and kids on it. I mean, you literally could run around, you know, on fire and no one would notice because... <laughs> They got their phones. <clears throat> now, I, it provides great fodder and entertainment, and I certainly get good laughs about it, but the reality is this. There is something significantly wrong with what is going on, because one, when you look at these electronic devices that they have, the, the cost of these devices are in the hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and they don't do without them, regardless of what their economic status is. They will sacrifice anything for it. Well, if you substituted the phone for something else, you would call it an addiction. You know, I, I told the parents, I said, if it was 228 and your kids were leaving class and immediately pulling out a bottle of alcohol, you'd say, oh my God, we've got to do something about this. These kids just can't get away from the alcohol. But same thing with the electronic devices. Now, as you go back in time, you start thinking about the fact that much of this was said about television as well. The boob tube. There was a reason it was called the boob tube. Because it was a belief that it would suck the brains out of the kids' heads and they wouldn't be able to think ever again. I grew up during that time. I'm not saying I'm a case study. I'm just saying I grew up at that time. You make your own inferences on that. But I will tell you this, that as educators, the challenge we face isn't to take the phone out of their hands, although we do, because we're not, as long as I'm here, going to allow students to use their phones during school under the guise that this is some sort of electronic device that is supporting their education. That is nonsense. The phone is not coming out. It gets put away, and the reason we do that is simple. They need to get it away from them, first of all, from a biological perspective, because bad things are happening inside of their cranium from being on that phone all the time. And I mean to a point where it is, it is damage that will be you know, forever damaged. Because again, when we take a look at brain development, and I'm certainly not an expert at this, but the, the figures are somewhere between 23 and 26 years old before the brain is fully developed. That's why we are so, so worried about students getting involved in illicit drug use. Because again, if we can keep them away from that, by the time they're 23, 26, we've got a pretty good shot that they're going to be OK. So as we take a look at the phones, they get put away. But in reality, they're going to grab that phone the minute they get the chance. And we're not taking it away from them. So our job is really to reinvent. Reinvent how we approach them relative to the phone. What are they using the phone for? Well, they use it for everything. They use it for texting. They use it for searching the internet. Unfortunately, they use it for things like getting so-called nukes, which obviously is a huge problem because, again, Back in the day, you know, corporations owned news, um, news stations and, and things like that, but there was a certain level of control that doesn't exist anymore. You know, news information is, is off the charts, and, and you can find, you know, again, we have people in the 21st century who still believe that the earth is flat. Um, this is what we're facing in education. How is it possible that people still believe that the earth is flat? Well, again, so as we take a look at you know, putting together an educational plan that's going to work for students who are highly visible, uh, visual and really subject to these kinds of influences, we've got to do a couple of things. One, we've got to be entertainers in some respect. 
You've got to bring entertainment to the world of education. Now people say you shouldn't have to do that. Well, that's really too bad. The reality is we've got kids who need to be entertained. The reality though, however, is that it's still education that has to get done. There is still content that they have to learn. So, as I'm walking down the hallway with Superintendent Schoonover, who came to visit yesterday, you know, I, I see our health assisting uh, freshmen in exploratory. There's a whole line of them going down on wheelchairs. And, you know, you're watching them struggle with the wheelchairs. And I know why Ms. Ribello is doing this. It's to give kids an empathetic understanding of what it is like to be disabled. And it's important for people to understand that. Because our education isn't just about the content that we teach them. I would like to say everyone graduating from Diamond Region is going to jump into the trade. They're not. Statistically, one in three will be in the trade probably within the first five years. So what we need to do is teach students how to learn and how to go about getting information that will help them grow and become lifelong learners. So I want to welcome everybody at this point and just very quickly, the objectives today at the end of the presentation attempting to understand the obligation instructors have in educating students in the process of reinvention as we face increased life experience and ever-changing technologies. I mean, it's amazing. People are living to 80, 90 years old. We don't think about this, but we need to. Can a retirement system sustain a general population of individuals who live as long as they're going to live. This is going to require great financial resources. And it may come to a time where the concept of retirement may not exist for some of these students. They may not have that luxury. What a horrible thought. But it's in fact true. I believe by the time 2050 rolls around, it is estimated that there will be 417,000 100-year-old people plus in this country. Think about the resources that are going to be required to sustain that type of a population. Second part is that you know, we will cover the concept of reinvention as it applies to both career readiness and cooperative education. I have two instructors who are going to talk to you about what they do, which we feel has reinvented education and is going to allow our students to be successful regardless of the trade that they enter. So, again, hopefully this will screw your conversations as well in terms of reinvention of what you do in the technical end. So, if, Mackenzie, if you could for me, could you start the video, please, if I could just go back there. One more time. There we go. Well, some of the brightest minds in the world are fans of books by our next guest, myself included. Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari explored the past and future of humanity in his book Sapiens and Homo Deus. They became international bestsellers with more than 12 million copies sold worldwide. His books were also praised by a wide range of thought leaders, including former President Barack Obama, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sir Richard Branson. In his new book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, Harari focuses on the present and dissects the most pressing issues facing humanity. You all know Harari. Good morning. Great to have you on. Congratulations on the book. So much of what we're talking about now in the future is based on technology and AI. And the big question many people have is, will AI help us as a race? Will they help us as a society? Or will AI lead to our downfall? Well, that depends on our question, on, on, on what we do with it. Yeah. I mean, technology is not deterministic. You can build very different societies with the same technology. Just as you could use trains and electricity and radio to build uh, communist dictatorships or fascist regimes or liberal democracies in the 20th century. Yeah. So also in the 21st century, you can use AI and biotechnology to build paradise or hell. It's up to us. And what about the jobs, though? I mean, the, the, one of the stories leading up to uh, this interview was about the need to retrain workers and the, the fear and loss of jobs due to automation. What, what can we expect in, in decades to come when it comes to jobs? Well, we can expect two things. I mean, the job market will completely change. 
And much of the struggle that people will have will be against irrelevance and not exploitation. Yeah, you said there's a real risk that we could create a massive useless class of people. Yeah, that's the biggest risk. That many people will lose completely their economic value and therefore also their political power. Now, there will be, of course, new jobs. Some jobs will disappear, many jobs will disappear, many jobs will emerge. The big question is whether people will be able to retrain and reinvent themselves in time and whether they can do it again and again and again. Because if you have a 50, 60 year career, as life expectancy also increases, you will have to do it not just once. Yeah. I mean, some people think that the AI revolution will be some big event following which the job market will settle into a new equilibrium. But this is very unlikely. The AI revolution will likely be a cascade of ever bigger disruptions. So you will have to reinvent yourself repeatedly. And here the biggest question, the, the biggest problem, may be psychological. Yes. Whether people have the mental ability to reinvent themselves at age 40, and again at 50, and again at 60. And you say we're not, we're not teaching, we're not preparing kids for this at school. No, not at all. And most of what kids learn today in school will probably be irrelevant by the time they are 40 or 50. And we don't really know what to teach them because nobody knows how the job market or the world would look like in 2050. It's maybe the first time in history we have no idea whatsoever how the job market would look like in, in, in 30 years. Yeah. So the, the best bet is to focus on emotional intelligence and mental stability and mental resilience. And how do you suggest people do that? I don't know. You meditate. <laughs> Vipassana meditation, two hours a day, I go for a 60 days retreat every Two hours week. a day? Yeah, and, and because of that, I know how difficult it is. And it's not easily scalable. And it's much more difficult to teach emotional intelligence or mental resilience mm -hmm. than to teach physics equations or to teach uh, history or whatever. And we don't have the tools at present to scale up this kind of teaching. So most of what we see in most schools is just inertia. We do what was relatively okay in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We're still, I mean, your point is we're still kind of stuffing kids full of information that they now can get pretty easily themselves. What we, what we need to do is teach them how to evaluate that information. And that's part of the thing. And it's not what I say, it's almost all experts on education would agree. Information is the last thing the kids need. They have far too much of it anyway. Yeah. And censorship today works in a very different way. In the past, censorship worked by blocking the flow of information. And information was very valuable. Yeah. Today, censorship works by flooding people with enormous amounts, not just of disinformation. Conflicting information. Yeah, conflicting information yeah. and simply irrelevant information. And one of the questions you raise is who's going to own that information and who's going to be owning that data in the future as well? Yeah, that's maybe the biggest political question. I mean, in, in ancient times, land was the most important asset in the economy. So politics was the struggle to control land. In the last 200 years, machines replaced land as the most important economic asset. So politics became the struggle to control the machines. And now data is replacing machines as the most important asset. So politics is really a struggle about who owns and who controls the flows of data in the world. So much to think about. Yuval Noah Harari, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. 21 Lessons for the 21st Century goes on sale tomorrow. So again, there's a few things I would disagree. I still think content is extremely important. I'm 23 and I live in Kyoto. But I there you go. Thank you again, we appreciate that. <clears throat> so in terms of teaching things that are relevant, one of the things that you are very familiar with, or maybe you're not familiar with, is that there are a number of strands that we are responsible for in the area of vocational education. When we decided approximately, I'd say seven years ago, to take 
strand five, which is called, you know, and again, they call it the soft skills, but it's actually not soft at all. It's extremely hard to teach. It is the employability skills. We actually took a portion of the academic time and have an actual course that we have freshmen and sophomores taking called career readiness. And I have Mrs. Canasta who's going to talk a little about what this entails. So, Mrs. Canasta, thank you very much.
started here, do you know that students do not know how to sign their names? They do not. I now teach cursive writing, at least to the point where they can sign a job application, a cover letter, all the documentation that they bring back to me has to be signed, and peer collaboration all has to be signed. So we're reinforcing those very important workplace skills, and these were all required in the strands for all shops, all areas. Uh, next. They also have online modules where they complete the coursework at self-pace, so they're using technology also, supplementing what we teach them in class with this online curriculum. We focus on all areas of business law, but especially you know, contracts and things like that, uh, entrepreneurship, counseling again, and I have an online module where I am reinforcing what we teach them, uh, business communication and rate communication. So they do get a lot of um, reinforcement in those areas. Lastly, the culmination of sophomore year, uh, actually in April, I do train the sophomores also to attend the job fair, which helps with their interviewing. But it all culminates into a portfolio where they put all of their business documentation that they've created over the two years. So we're demonstrating growth, we're showing them, and they see this, how much they've grown in the two years that they've been with us. And they look back, they're, they're freshmen, can I change this? They say, no, 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 that's the idea. We want to see that you're growing, see how far you've come. We encourage them, and we hope someday to be able to expand our program to junior year. Right now, Mr. Lazar is going to talk about what he does. Um, he does take the ball and run with it, and, and does, again, reinforce those interviewing skills to prepare them for their co-op uh, interviews and jobs. Um, but, but we are working as a team now and hopefully developing that to the junior and senior year so that we can do more for the college prep also, helping them with FAFSA. Then, I mean, the sky's the limit. There's so many things we could be doing with them. Um, but again, we'll have to reinvent that as, as we go. <laughs> so that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'll turn the mic over to Ms. Lazaro. does, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of these things, uh, specifically the development of hybrid and niche markets, industries. What is that? People say, well, it sounds fancy. So when an employer calls me and says, Mr. Lazaro, I need a kid that can run a CNC uh, machine, keep work at SolidWorks, understands AutoCAD, a little bit of logistics, I say, wow, you just told me three shops, easy, one more. It's these roles that we have to maximize our students' abilities. And as programs, we cannot think in silos. The world does not work in silos. As I'm looking at Mr. Patel and his people, they see the program patterns can cut out, correct? That's a machine to me, but it's good. Psychology of interviewing techniques and branding. We can sit here and say, well, we're going to put on our shirt and tie, and that's great. But really what we're talking about is we're branding ourselves. And when I speak to students about this, the branding really goes further than just going through that door, shaking a hand, and hitting a resume in. You are creating an image outside that world. And in today's increasing technology advancements, it's scary. Because the brand of you extends from your social media to interactions, to connections you make. And that, even at a very, very young age, is impactful on a career pathway. And if continue education of students, industrial organizational issues, as we look at students and we look at people in general, more and more mental health issues, more and more things going on in the workplace that are rising. You got people uh, taking people to court for things that happened 20 years ago. It's amazing what's going on out there in the workplace and how the behaviors are going. So let's look forward. I'm going to start at the bottom and come back up. Before Mrs. Denny and Mrs. Canastra have a heart attack, the resume is not necessarily dead. But the quote by the by from hrdiet.com, which is pretty reputable and they're kind of on the forefront of HR topics, that's what they're saying. The resume is dead. Wait a minute, what do you mean the resume is dead? It's dead in many ways. With technology, the advent of technology, the advancement, it's mind boggling. Artificial intelligence is being used right now today to assess people's capability or, or compatibility with the job. Tesla uses it. An evolution of resume is going to come to a point where, like on a new speed in Google, you'll see a clip play for a couple of seconds, 
That could will consist of a candidate saying, my name's Kevin Lazaro, and I'm applying for the position director of co-op. And the person on the other end is going to look at that and click on it. And then that's going to take you to a place like LinkedIn, or something that will come up in the next 20 years. And that person is going to say, on LinkedIn, or whatever platform it may be, is people vouching. You create this network, this brand. And you need to understand that's the future of interviewing and hiring. Now, it's not to say we kill what we do here because it's still relevant. This is the early adopters, like all technologies. And what we're talking about is the next 15 to 20 years. And Mackenzie's lifetime should see that. And so, as I, you know, hand it back over to Mr. Altman, I leave with this thought. Mr. Altman's right. If we stay stagnant, we'll be fine. But I don't think our students deserve fine. I don't think my kids deserve fine. So it's our jobs, obligation to see what is out there, collaborate with our advisors to tell us what's going on there. And that will help us shape the new school. It will help us shape our programs. It will help shape what myself and Mrs. Kinash can do as we move forward to the next 30, 40 years of what we do here. With that being said, it's probably going to hand it back over to you. Thank you very much. So finally, to wrap up, we're going to talk about the reinvention of our uh, physical building, Diamond Major. You know, it's amazing when people come in and they say, wow, the place is in great shape. Why would you possibly need a new school? They're obviously not coming, first of all, at the right time. They need to come during lunchtime and see how packed our school is. Uh, it is right now, we have five lunches. It starts at somewhere close to 11 o'clock and then it's close to 1.30 in the afternoon at this point. So when you take a look at just the lunch issue, we realize that we're overcrowded. We're overcrowded in a number of other ways. Um, last year we had over 800 applications for 375 slots. I am still getting calls from numerous stakeholders out there about the possibility of their child or a child that they know coming into Diamond Regional. This is a huge problem because on the one hand, we've got that call coming in and we've got employers calling up and saying, why can't we get more qualified people to come to work? Well, again, if you look at our construction cluster, <coughs> we're sold out. If you take a look at our business technology program, we're almost sold out. In our manufacturing cluster, in particular advanced manufacturing, we're sold out. We could easily expand probably 12 of our programs, another 100 students each, and still not meet the demand that is out there. That is why I'm glad to announce to you that hopefully by January of 2009, we will be offering the first um, Chapter 74 post-secondary program in advanced manufacturing, because clearly we need to expand our access to the job market and to the labor market so we can fill the needs that you are desperately trying to fill. With that in mind, what I have up here is what's called the MSBA Module 1 Deliverables. Currently, we are in the MSBA pipeline, which means that the state of Massachusetts, taking a look at what we submitted as a statement of interest, declared that Diamond Regional is qualified for either a major renovation of a new school. So what we've asked the staff to do is start visioning on what the new school would look like relative to their own programs. I can assure you that if your program is going to look similar to what it did in 1968, or if that's your vision, that's not going to go very far. You know, as we walked Superintendent Schoonover through advanced manufacturing, I had to tell him, be careful walking on the floor. There's, you know, 50 years of oil and chips that are on that floor. So as it gets humid, that oil comes seeping up. These are the things that are not fixable without a great deal of money. When you take a look at our infrastructure, we put together a list, a maintenance plan that we're working on. We have estimated just to repair this building, to bring it into the 21st century, without adding one more seat, we're looking at somewhere around $72 million. So when you take a look at the fact that it would take $72 million, and there's no hyperbole there. You know, just look at our parking lot. To redo our parking lot, you've got to be talking close to $3 million. It might even be more. So as you start looking at that, real, in, real, in, in real terms, a renovation's not going to make it. 
it's going to end up being a new build. So where are we right now? Here's where we're at. In terms of all the deliverables that we need to deliver, everything in yellow has been sent up to the MSBA office. We have until March 29, 2019 to send all of our deliverables up. We're not waiting. We're going to get them up, and we're going to get them up by November. Because if we get them up by November, then we can be on the agenda for the MSBA in December. Why are we trying to rush this? We're trying to rush it for two reasons. The most important one is the fact that every month that goes by in construction, every month delay is an escalation in terms of cost. So when you take a look at an escalation of approximately 7% a year on a project that's going to be millions and millions of dollars, we don't have the luxury right now of being sort of blasé with taxpayers' money. Because what they're looking for is a return on investment. Our reimbursement rate right now is 72.43%, which is an incredibly favorable rate. We're hoping to gain 1.5% on top of that with our maintenance and capital plan. If we wait until December and January, that rate is going to change based on economic conditions. If you take a look at how things have been going economically, and again, I'm not talking about the individual, but I'm talking about the economy in general, there is a significant improvement that could easily depress that rate that we're currently getting. So we are working desperately to make sure we get on the agenda in December, and we hope that we report out in April to you that Diamond Regional has signed a feasibility agreement and we begin the process of hiring an, a project manager and an architect to start talking about the new school at Diamond Major. I can tell you at the 50th anniversary and a couple of events that we've had recently, we have the full support of the legislative delegation. And I have to say something. Speaking to my brothers at Marva and my sisters at Marva, they don't have that luxury. They have to get the legislative delegation to support them. Our legislative delegation has said Diamond Regional is hugely important to the economic community here in the Southeast Coast, and we need to do something to support them. So we will keep you posted in terms of our progress as we move forward. Um, before I end, just a couple of things. Uh, Mrs. Thompson, the special education meeting is in... The special education advisory meeting is now in room B110. Okay, B110 for the special education advisor. And I got done before 7 o'clock for you Patriots fans out there, so, okay. I'm a Patriots fan too, so <laughs> I hope you have a terrific meeting, and I want to thank you very much for attending. Thank you.